We like success. Actually, we more than like it, we really love it. Isn't it amazing how um, people change to become a fan of a team that just won the championship? <laughs> they're out buying t-shirts. They never liked that team before, but now they're a fan because the team is successful. And, uh, and so we, we have you know, this, this tendency to really like success. And we're going to talk today about that and how sometimes when we're successful, and you may not think you're successful at all, but we're, everybody has something, some measure of, of you know, goodness about them that they feel, hey, you know, I'm pretty good at this. I've done this. I've done that. We've got our own opinions about things. We, we, we like to put ourselves forward and, and feel some measure of, of what we would call success or, or, you know, just being good in somebody else's eyes. And one of the things that we have to, to talk about, because the Scripture talks about it, is that there is a danger that's attached to success. There's a danger of wanting others to speak well of you. And we see this in the story of Gideon. Now remember Gideon, uh, he was raised up as a judge and he fought it tooth and nail. He said, I'm not the guy, I don't want to do this, I'm not qualified to do this, very much like Moses in the Older Testament, right? And so, uh, so here he is, he says, I, I can't do this, and so God uses him. And, and, of course, he strips away thousands and thousands and thousands of warriors and says, you don't need all that. And so God is reinforcing the fact that he is going to be the one who is going to win the victory, win the battle. Uh, I don't need strong people. I just need someone who's willing. And so Gideon, he, he, he gets the message. Or does he? We're going to look at the passage right after the victory. So remember now, Gideon is the leader of 300 people that go into battle against thousands and thousands and thousands of Midianites and other troops. And God, remember, won the battle by causing them to conf be confused and fight each other. And then, of course, the, their, the rest of the, of the troops are, are running for their lives, and these 300 people are chasing them, and they are asking other people now to get involved in the cleanup. So we look at chapter 8 of Judges. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, you want to open it right now. Judges chapter 8, verse 1. It says this, Then the people of Ephraim asked Gideon, Why have you treated us this way? Why didn't you send for us when you first went out to fight the Midianites? Here it is. Why didn't you? The first sign of, of true success is someone criticizes you. Why didn't you do it this way? Why didn't you include me? You see, other people like success too. And a lot of people love to be on, on, on the, the coattails of someone else's success, especially if you know the person. You say, well, you could have asked me. I could have been there. I could have helped with that. And so the, the, this community now that he is asking, these are the group of, of Israelites, he's saying, now, I want you to join me in the cleanup efforts so that we can clear these Midianites out once and for all. And they say, why didn't you ask before? Wow. Wow. It says, they argued heatedly with Gideon. But Gideon, he was... A, I guess a born politician, he says, well, what I've accomplished compared to, what have I accomplished compared to you? Uh, aren't even the leftover grapes of Ephraim's harvest better than the entire crop of my little clan? So he's, he's kind of saying, no, you guys, are, you guys are cool, you guys are good, you guys got lots better things than I have and my family has. He says, God gave you victory over Oreb and Zeb, the commanders of the Midianite army. What have I accomplished compared to that? When the men of Ephraim heard Gideon's answer, their anger subsided. So he, he gets into this little political soiree, and, and he's talking and he's saying, well, okay, you know, it's cool. You're good, too. You're good, too. Don't worry about it. And so they, they kind of cool their jets a little bit. Well, you know, people haven't changed in the history of the world. When you do something right, 
When you do something that's worthy of anyone's accolade at all, someone is going to criticize you. No matter how good it is, no matter how wonderful you are, someone will think of some way to take what you did well and turn it into something bad. They will. Well, it happens, right? People haven't changed, and they say, why didn't you ask me? Why didn't you do it the way I think you should have done it? There's all kinds of little criticisms, right? Well, now, another criticism comes from people who don't think that Gideon, get this, they don't think he did enough yet, right? Well, you might have done some good stuff, but come on, there's a lot more work that could be done, right? I mean, you work your tail off at something, and you, you finally get to the place where you feel like, okay, I've accomplished something, and someone has to step up and say, yeah, but there could be more, <laughs> right? You could, have been, you could have done that better than you did, even though it was okay, but it could have been so much better, right? Here, here's, the, here's the text. Gideon crosses the Jordan River with his 300 men, and though they're all exhausted, they continued to chase the enemy. When, when they reached Succoth, Gideon asked the leaders of the town, please give my warriors some food. They're very tired. I'm chasing these people, the kings of Midian. But the officials of the town replied, catch Zeba and Zalumna first, and then we'll feed your army. Really? Really? You haven't done enough yet. Uh, you, you go out and finish your job, and then we'll talk, right? Then we'll talk. In other words, you haven't done enough yet to deserve my recognition. You could do more. You could do better. Fill in the blank, right? So Gideon said, now, it's, it's starting to get under Gideon's skin. Now, keep in mind, all the glory was supposed to go to who? To God, right? And now Gideon, he's the leader of this group, and he's saying, hey, you, could you help a little bit here? And they're saying, well, no, you, you should have asked earlier. And now he's at a point where he's saying, hey, can you just feed my army? I mean, we're kind of tired. We've been doing this stuff for God. And, all. and they're, they're saying, well, no, you got to do more before we help you. And it says this. It says, from there, Gideon went up to Peniel and again asked for food, but he got the same answer. So he said to these people, after I return in victory, I am going to tear down this tower. And by the time Zeba and Zumna were in a car corps with about 15,000 warriors, all that remained of the allied armies of the east, for 120,000 had already been killed, Gideon circled around the caravan and uh, he took the Midianite army by surprise. And Zeba and, and Zalumna and the two Midianite kings, uh, they fled. But Gideon chased them down and captured all their warriors. And then after this, Gideon returned from the battle uh, by the way of Harry's Pass. And there he captured a young man from Succoth and demanded that he write down the names of all the 70 officials and elders in the town. And Gideon then returned to the town and said to the leaders, here are Zeba and Zalumna. These are the people that said, well, you haven't finished the job yet. You've got to kill these two guys, right? And so he presents them to the people that didn't want to give him food until he'd finished the job. And uh, says, then Gideon took the elders of a town and taught them a lesson. I'll teach you a lesson. Now, here, here it comes. When we do something good, either in our own eyes that we think deserves some measure of recognition, and people don't give us what we think we deserve, sometimes we turn the tables. Even though we know that what we did was only through the power and the strength of God, we, we think we deserve a little something. And when people are mean to us or when they criticize us, what is the human temptation? I'm going to teach these people a lesson. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I sure have. I sure have. I get really creative with it, too. Okay? Now, I see a lot of heads going like, yeah, maybe, you know. I've spent lots of hours thinking about how to get back at these people, you know? Right? 
And even if we don't, we think about it. We do. So Gideon says, I'm going to teach them a lesson, punishing them with thorns and briars from the wilderness. And he also tore down that tower, and he killed all of the men of the town. Now, this is serious. What Gideon does is he kills the very people that he was trying to set free. God said, I want you to kill the Midianites. They're the oppressors. And here, these are, these are the, the Israelites that are just treating Gideon badly. And he turns on his own family. Have you ever turned on a friend or a family member because they were critical? They were mean to you? Yeah, it happens. It happens. You see, th this is a human story. It's what I love about the Bible. It, it doesn't pull any punches. It says, this is what humans do. And we have to find ourselves here in Gideon's place. And so the thing that really happens that we have to watch out for is being defensive, right? I mean, God's going to use us in our life, whatever we do, whatever our sphere of influence is. We hope that we can do good for God. We want to bring Him honor. We want to bring Him glory. We're created in His likeness and in His image in order to do that. And whatever good things that we can accomplish in life, we're supposed to be directing the glory back to God because He's the one who created us in the first place. He gave us our brains. He gave us our talents, our abilities, our gifts, our whatever, right? God deserves it all. And yet we can feel the need to become defensive, defend ourselves. So Gideon finally loses it. This is the first time one of the judges that God chose to set his people free actually fails before the end of the story. I mean, he really, really bombs on this one. This is the leader that God cho chooses to set an example. Remember last week, we talked about the fact Gideon said, hey, when we go into battle, keep your eyes on me and just do what I do. Now, what's he doing? Does he want everybody to follow his lead now? You see, um, it's very interesting. It says that in verse 18, Gideon asked Ziba and Zalumna, the men you killed at Tabor, what were they like? Now, this is the, these are the enemy kings, right, that he captured. He says, what were these people like that you killed at Tabor? And they said, like you. Like you. They all had the look of a king's son. In other words, they looked like you. Uh, they were my brothers, the sons of my own mother, Gideon says. Okay. Let's talk about not somebody picking on you, not somebody criticizing you, but somebody criticizing somebody you love. You know what? You can say all kinds of nasty things about me. I've heard so many things, okay? <laughs> Whatever gets said, it eventually gets back. It does. I, lo I loved one of them. Uh, I was at one, one church one time, and some guy, he just didn't like me. And it was about the time that the, the movie Bruce Almighty came out. <laughs> and that was, that was his mind. You, know, well, you think you're just Bruce Almighty, you know? Going like, whoa, okay, wow. Okay, it's his perception, you know? Well, you know what? You can, you can pick on me. People can pick on you. But if you start talking bad about my wife, you start dissing my kids, you are in trouble. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, we, we can take the hits. I mean, yeah, buck up, you know, be a man, be a woman, all that stuff, you know, but, but you start picking on somebody that I love, someone who I want to protect, who I'm called to stand in the gap for, you better watch out. Now, now I'm saying this in a very human way. I shouldn't be saying that at all. But that's our tendency. And, and Gideon all of a sudden says, you picked on my family. You killed my family. And now 
you're going to pay. You are going to pay. And so Gideon says this. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, I wouldn't kill you if you hadn't killed them. But he turns to Jether, his oldest son, and he said, kill him. But Jether did not draw his sword, for he was only a boy, and he was afraid. Can you imagine that? So then Ziba and Zalumna said to Gideon, be a man, kill us yourself. So Gideon killed them both and took their royal ornaments from their necks and their other camels and basically deed done, right? Now, all this to say, all this to say, Satan knows which buttons to push. Okay? I mean, keep in mind, you and I are human. And Satan can take a good person who's doing good things, and someone comes along and becomes critical, picks on you or picks on someone that you love, and all of a sudden, that button is pushed, and you're off chain. Suddenly you're doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing. You're angry. You want revenge. You, you start thinking of ways to get back at people. We shouldn't go there, but we do. But this story is here to give us a warning. This potential lies in all of us. It does. And we have to pray against that. You see, we can be tempted to let any measure of success that we have or any, you know, thing that we think that we deserve accolades for or consideration for, and we get to thinking we deserve somebody's approval or support. Uh, it's dangerous ground, right? Uh, another area is we can be tempted to strike back instead of being a peacemaker. See, to be called to be like Jesus is to be able to find a way to ask God to, to stand in the gap because he took the hits for us and now we need to take our hits. We need to be able to say, you know, if someone lashes out at me, maybe I need to pray for them because something is going on in their life that they need something special. They need God in their life. And to turn that and say, now here's an opportunity for me to be Jesus here. Not to strike back, because we can all find a creative way to do that. Instead, we're called to what? Bless those who curse us and say all kinds of evil things about us or our families, right? Bless and do not curse. Those are the words of Jesus. Right? I mean, to be like Jesus is not to seek revenge, not to seek self glory. It's to be the peacemaker in the situation. Now, there's another level, a whole other level that goes on beyond this now. And, and this is very sad and very scary at the same time. The people now are afraid of Gideon. What has happened is Gideon has taken his position and the power that God gave him and he's used it in a negative way to establish himself as the leader. I am in charge now and I will use force if necessary to make sure that you recognize what I've done. Of course for God, but I've done it. All right? Now, here is the next section. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, Be our ruler. Be our ruler. You and your son and your grandson will be our rulers, for you have rescued us from Midian. Now Gideon, he tries to make a, a, a slight recovery here from the situation. And he says this. He says, I will not rule over you, nor will my son. The Lord will rule over you. Now that's the right thing to say, right? I mean, no other God but God. I'm not here to rule over you. God is your ruler. But look at the next word. However, however, you see, he saw a human opportunity here. 
Here is what follows the however. I do have one request. Here it is. That each of you give me an earring from the plunder you collected from your fallen enemies. Now you're thinking, that can't be much. Well, you remember there were like 20,000 or 120,000 people? I mean, 120,000 earrings made of gold? That, that's a fair amount of cash, all right? And so he says, uh, you give me this plunder that you collected from your fallen enemies. And um, they said, gladly, gladly, they replied. So they spread out a cloak, and each one threw in a gold earring he had gathered from the plunder. And the weight of the gold earrings was 43 pounds. 43 pounds. I'd like to know what that's worth in today's economy. Someone, you know, is looking that up on, on the Internet right now. I know they are. Okay. <laughs> Put away your phone. Put away your phone. And that, that, didn't include, that didn't include the royal ornaments and the pendants from the purple clothing worn by the kings of Midian and the chains around their necks of the camels. So then Gideon, here's what he does. Interesting. Gideon makes a sacred ephod from the gold and put it in Ophrah, his hometown. But soon, all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. Does this sound a little like the golden calf? You see, the ephod was to be worn by the high priest. He was the mediator between the people and God. And on, on this ephod that, the, that he wore, uh, there was a place where they, they carried the umum and the thumum, thermum, okay? I think I said that right, right? Some come close. I don't know. I, I'm not Hebrew, so I don't know. Anyway, what they were were dice, okay? They were basically, you know, like a, like a pair of dice. And, and, and when they would ask God, when the priest would ask God a question, should we do this, should we not do this, all these things, there were always yes and no questions of God. And they would want direction from God. And so he would take the umum and the thumum and the thermum, and, and he would throw the dice, and if they were like double green or double heads up, it was yes. If it, if it was double down, it was no. And if it was one up, one down, it was eh, come back later, okay? <laughs> basically. Okay, basically. <laughs> okay. You see, you see what Gideon did? He took the decision-making away from God. He said, I want the power to make my own decisions. Isn't that the number one thing that we want? We, we go to God and we have our list and we want him to sign off on it. We want the power to decide yes or no. And, and so Gideon says, just one thing I want from you. I want the power to be the one you come to. They didn't go to the temple anymore. They came to his house. They came to him for the decision-making power. And that's really the end of it. it, it it's, it's this self-deception where Gideon says, God is Lord. He, no one is over, over me or you but God himself. However... When it comes to making important decisions, I, I, I'm going to still be in charge. And I, I'm, I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure that God validates my choice. That, that's a hard place to be. And we see that, that Gideon, he ruled, it says throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 more years. There was peace in the land. But we're going to find that it wasn't a very good peace. See, there's peace that comes from God, and there's a manufactured peace that we try to create for ourselves. There's a peace that we say that, that exists when we have enough money 
to more than pay the bills, to be able to do the things that we want to do, then we're at peace. We manufacture ways in which we feel good about ourselves and, and we think things are really peaceful when in, really, in reality it's not a real peace. It's a human kind of peace that we have. It's all circumstantial. It's, it's all about everything being in order. But how do you feel when something goes wrong? Do you suddenly go wacko? It's like, ooh, my world's falling apart. You see, it's in those moments that we find out if we're really dependent upon God or circumstances. And, and so we see here, Gideon's biggest mistake is he allows Satan to get under his skin through the criticism of other people, and he re reacts humanly, and then because he's out of sync with God, what does he do? He positions himself with whatever power he has to be able to make sure that he gets what he wants. See, we can easily vocalize our loyalty to God's rule in our life. But is it a reality across the board? Is it genuinely? Is God in charge of everything in our life? Can we say, I have peace in spite of the fact that maybe somebody is at odds with me? There's a peace that resonates in spite of the circumstances being chaotic. You see, that's when you know God's in charge. That's when you know you've, you've really recognized that He is the one that deserves your recognition, your, His glory. What, what we do is really incidental. We don't deserve anything. God deserves it all. He created us, and He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants us to bask in the fact that we've been created in His image. And the more that we can express His love and His image to other people, the, the more peace we'll have. But when we start trying to grab a little bit of glory ourselves, when we want people to like us, and all of our, our being rests right there. It depends on whether or not I'm liked, whether or not I'm appreciated, whether or not I feel like people are, are, are okay with me. Then we get off. Things start falling apart. Well, we live in a consumer-driven society that bases everybody's self-worth on how good they do something what product they can produce. And if you don't do that, you're a nobody. Right? Don't buy it for a second. It's a lie. It's a button that Satan wants to push. He wants to tell you that you're only worth something if you're productive, if you do something that other people will look at and go, ooh, isn't that great? It's not true. God loves you just the way you are. He died to prove it. He set you free from that kind of thinking. And He wants you to be secure in your relationship with Him. And our job is to keep reminding one another that we're loved. We're loved. And it's not conditional on whether or not you produce. God will continue to love you. And what we do is we continue to focus on giving all the glory for who we are, for what we can accomplish. All the glory goes to Him. Keep redirecting people's attention to God. Be loving, be kind, be a peacemaker, be everything that Jesus calls you to be. Let His fruit of the Spirit reign in your life. And then suddenly, whether people like you or not, Maybe they'll like God. Because isn't that really our purpose? Is to help people love God, their creator who loves them. All right, let's pray. God, thank you that, that you created us to, to be loved and to love you in return. Help us to love one another, to not be critical of each other, to not be competitive in terms of what we can accomplish. 
how great we are in someone else's eyes. God, forgive us for those kinds of feelings that our self-worth is wrapped up in what we do. Um, God, thank you that you love us, that we can have a peace in our heart that goes beyond human understanding and, and human parameters, God. The, the peace that you give us is a peace of knowing that we're loved, we're accepted, we're forgiven. Help us to project that to one another, God, as we continue to love you and lift up your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.